You wanna play a little game? <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. A while back, I mentioned that I would be getting around to talking about one of the Nintendo Wii U's launch titles, New Super Mario Bros. U, but I'll be calling it Mario U in this video for the sake of brevity. In addition, stick around if you want to hear an addendum video about my thoughts on Barbie and the magic of Pegasus. Mario U began development immediately after the release of New Super Mario Bros. Wii, with a development cycle of three years to coincide with the re release of the Nintendo Wii U. By the time Mario Wii had released in 2009, the team had already started work on the Wii U sequel. Although by 2010, some veterans of the team, as well as younger developers at Nintendo, were poached to begin work on New Super Mario Bros. 2 for the 3DS as well. This wasn't that big of a deal, considering that most of EPD-10 was kept around to make Mario U great, although this didn't stop both titles from having coinciding release years. New Super Mario Bros. 2 released in July, while Mario U came out just four months later in November. Now I'm going to jump ahead a bit and say that while both of these games are great, it's not easy to deny that releasing two games in the same genre, in the same franchise, so similar to each other, wouldn't cause burnout among consumers. New Super Mario Bros. 2 had a decent amount of fanfare when it first came out. It certainly bolstered the 3DS's early software offerings, considering that the 3DS catalog by 2012 was still a little bit anemic. But Mario U had a lot of weight on its shoulders. It had to follow up the ever-so-popular Mario Wii, but it also had to set a good precedent for the ill-fated Wii U. Honestly, that last part is a fool's errand all on its own, but I'd argue that making a sequel for the most influential 2D platformer of the 2000s was an even taller order. By the time everything was all said and done, New Super Mario Bros. U had become the best-selling game for the Wii U. But alas, this success is not without folly. By the end of the Wii U's life cycle, the game had only sold 5.82 million copies, a significant decline in sales after the Wii and DS blockbusters. Jumping ahead a bit again, I'll be generous in saying that the game sold way more than that. If you include the sales from the standalone New Super Luigi U and the Nintendo Switch's New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, the combined sales of the game were well over 22 million. While those lifetime sales are a lot better than that 5 million number from earlier, it's clear that that wasn't exactly what Nintendo was hoping for in the short term. It may also be the reason why we haven't seen a fully original 2D Mario game in well over a decade. Now, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out that the reason for the sharp decline in sales was because the Wii U was a commercial failure. But I would argue that there were three other factors that rang the death knell for poor Mario U. As I already mentioned, I think consumers were burnt out by having two side-scrolling Mario games in the same year. And believe you me, I love these four games with my heart and soul. But the quick release scheme is likely what caused the Joe Schmoes and plain Jane midwits of the world to be biased against these games and blindly calling them unoriginal, when they are, without a shadow of a doubt, easily more fun and memorable than the first five main series Mario games, possibly combined. Secondly, I think the diminishing returns were also a result of the decline of the games industry by this point. The eighth generation of video games was kind of in a transitional period for gaming as a whole. With the ending of the era that was first-person shooters and the Wild West era for mobile gaming ending, granted, mobile games and FPSs are still the lifeblood of this industry even today, but their heyday was over a decade ago, and this was well before the open-world craze really took into effect. Yeah, there was Minecraft and all, but games like Breath of the Wild, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Elden Ring, and other open-world games were still a pipe dream away, so gamers were still trying to find the next big thing. This caused Mario U to get passed by the wayside because it was a launch title for a console that was dead on arrival. The console itself was competing against another one that was also dead on arrival, and a preeminent device that would win the generation by default. However, the third and final factor that was likely the nail in the coffin for this game has got to be the fact that New Super Mario Bros. U is an ungraceful sequel. Now what I mean by that is that the game is doing a decent enough job at succeeding its pre predecessor but it loses the fundamental soul of what made the predecessor so beloved. There's a lot of games out there like this today. Halo 3 to 4, Angry Birds 1 to 2, Plants vs. Zombies 1 to 2. But a great example is the comparison that Ego Raptor makes between the first three Castlevania games to the fourth one. So what's the problem here? Debatably, all those sequels were good, yeah, but they failed to gracefully expand upon what worked with their predecessors. 
For Castlevania 4, it was the whip being overpowered. For Angry Birds 2, it was the single-use birds. For PBZ 2, it was too many plants. And for Halo 4, it was... Well, fucking everything, really, but no, mostly it was the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. As for NSMBU, I would say that it's not eager enough to experiment. Hear me out. In 1-4, they really want you to use this stupid-ass pink baby Yoshi to float across the level, but outside of here, it's never useful again. How about in 2-5, another athletic level? Here, you're probably thinking you want to use the baby Yoshi to float across the gaps, right? Well, the damn thing spawns in World 1, and because the maps are interconnected instead of through a menu, you have to walk all the way back to the spawn point if you want to use it again. And this was as opposed to just building the whole level around the pink baby Yoshi to begin with. And that's just one instance of frustration. But I think the most egregious thing in the game is the acorn. The acorn turns you into a flying squirrel, and you get acquainted with it as early as World 1. Does it work? Hell yeah, it works! You can glide wherever you want, you can stick to walls, you can jump in the air. It's basically a better cape feather from Mario World because it's more balanced. So it's incredibly frustrating that they didn't utilize more of this power-up throughout the game. Considering it's the only new one, I mean, what happened here? Let's look at how EPD 8 incorporates mainstay game mechanics into their titles for comparison. In Mario Galaxy 2, you basically become obsessed with the Cloud Flower because it lets you do all this cool stuff like staying alive across gaps, especially in the last level. In 3D Land, you become so acquainted with the Raccoon Leaf that by the final level, the level toys with you because you're so over-reliant on it. In 3D World, you become so obsessed with the Cat Bell that you use it pretty much constantly. You can climb walls with it, you can dive bomb, and once it's ripped away from you, you feel totally naked because you can't get through the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay without it. I could go on here, guys, but what does EPD-10 really do with the last level of Mario U? Eh, just kick around a Koopa shell, guys, because that's what you guys want to do the whole game, right? Kick Koopa shells? This isn't even as cool as 9-8 from Mario Wii because there's no King Bills flying around to try and kill you. No, they use them in a secret level in World 5, and I doubt anyone even played that level except for me. Look. I know it sounds like I hate this game and that I've basically been sitting here bitching and moaning forever, but I really do like this game. It's just that, as a big Mario fan, I feel that there are enough missteps to put this objectively superior title in terms of level design below Mario Wii because of the grievances that I have with its design. I didn't even talk about what I liked about this game. I love the fact that they made the Kooplings into actually creative boss fights. I like that Bowser Jr.'s clown car has boxing gloves now. I actually really like the acorn because it lets you fly all over the place. I love that as you slowly make your way back to Peach's castle, it becomes enveloped in smoke, and by the time you get there, it's actually covered in lava. The World 9 levels in this game are all actually pretty good, too. I mean, there are no 9-7, but it's still going to give you a run for your money if you're a noob. Oh yeah, and new Super Luigi U. The game's an add-on to NSMBU, and I'd highly recommend checking it out. It's basically like the Lost Levels, but better but it's going to be hard if you're a first-timer. So yeah, if you got time, pick this game up on the Switch. You might just like it better than me. But just as a heads up, if you play the Switch version with four players, you're going to be forced to play as Toadette, who is like an easy mode for the game. She wasn't in the Wii U original either. But then again, playing with four people always means that at least one person is going to suck anyway. There is a happy ending in all this, though. EPD-10 would, of course, go on to develop NSLU and NSMBU DX, but they would also find themselves developing Pikmin 3 and Mario Maker 1 and 2. As of right now, they're currently developing Pikmin 4 for the Switch. Okay, that's the end of the video. But if you stuck around for this long, then that means you want to hear me talk about Barbie and the Magic of Pegasus. Well, this was a request by a fan. You know who you are! So I figured I'd give this a quick look before I sign off. Okay, uh, this is a movie that came out in 2005, I think. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can review this just by reading the Wikipedia plot synopsis, so here we go. Okay, so she wants to go ice skating, and then she gets told not to ice skate, and then her parents get, like, turned to stone or something. The fuck? Uh, okay, oh, oh, her sister's a Pegasus. All right, that makes sense. I guess that's where the title comes from. Anyway, they need the Chaos Emeralds or some shit to fight against a uh, default Oblivion character. And then they do it, and then they save the day. Wow. How epic and brave. 
I give this movie a 17 out of 10. Maybe someday I'll actually watch it. Okay, see you guys tomorrow.